Well, good morning, church. If you would, please open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to take a break from Colossians 3 and 4 this morning. I want to remind you that our content team has put together a devotional that walks right alongside the sermon. You can text the word sermon to 45776. As I now tell you, now what in light of all that God has done in greater still? In 1954, there was a struggling milkshake salesman by the name of Ray Kroc. I mean, what a job, right? Uh, Of all the occupations that the Lord could give you, you know, I want to be a milkshake salesman, Lord. Well, Ray was, and you know, things weren't really going very well. In fact, his company was almost on the brink of bankruptcy. But yet, all of a sudden, just one day, he received this phone call out of nowhere. And there was a restaurant in San Bernardino, California, that ordered an astonishing amount of milkshake machines. And so Ray just wanted to clarify, are you sure they want this many milkshake machines? But he had to see it for himself. And so he went all the way to San Bernardino, California, and he found a restaurant there that was obsessed with the process, that had a zealous passion to get fast service, high-quality food, disposable packaging, and a family-friendly atmosphere to as many people in San Bernardino as possible. And as Ray was sitting there watching these milkshake machines go in and all of these people getting their burgers and fries and a milkshake, instantly he knew this could be so much more. With some intentionality, with a zealous focus, with 100% engagement, this process could have a global impact. And after seasons of arduous and very copious discussions, Ray and the founders of this company began to merge And as Ray began to rename this restaurant to McDonald's, he stood before his board of investors and told them the now what of how they could take this process to the ends of the earth. And the result of that vision, now every single day, 1% of the entire world eats McDonald's. Currently, they have 150,000 employees every single hour of each day. They have 36,000 restaurants in 100 different countries, and last year, their total sales were just under $25.49 billion. I don't know about you, but my household, about 10% of that was spent on their French fries, all right? What can happen when people are 100% engaged in a process? And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That it would be my heart for you as God's people, that we would keep pressing on toward BA and beyond. That we would use this two-year sense of God's grace among us. That we would give our life now to ministry, to missions, and to his future. What does that look like? Just one verse this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. We began this journey two years ago with a 100% engagement goal. That every single one of us, the thousands that gather, plugged in, locked in, strategically and intentionally, giving their life to greater ministry, greater missions, and greater future. Look what God's done by God's grace. Well, the church of Corinth was in a similar situation. You see, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, and arguably one of the greatest chapters in the entire New Testament, confesses and confirms and celebrates the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything has changed because of Jesus. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, gives us the earliest historical content of the resurrection of Christ in the entire Bible. He is going to detail to us the significance of our union in Christ and our future resurrection with Christ. You see, the resurrection is the most verified fact in all of history. There are 300 prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. It was the conviction of the New Testament writers that you and I have a physically raised, victorious Savior, as they mentioned the risen Christ 104 separate times. You see, the Bible finds its sum in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's today, in celebration of God's grace and blessing during greater still, that I want to motivate us Knowing our salvation in Christ is secured. Knowing our future resurrection with Christ is sure that you and I will press on toward BA and beyond in ministry, missions, and future. You see, currently, Corinth is this this small, insignificant town. 
But in the New Testament, it was a thriving, strategically located seaport town that was immersed in three cultures, Greek, Roman, and Jew. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul does not try to prove the resurrection of Jesus. He just simply reiterates a biblical fact of what Christ and Christ alone has done. That Christ died, that Christ was buried, that Christ was raised, and that he appeared to many. That Christ did what no other could do. That you and I serve a risen Savior. He's alive that he's alive in us. He is the Lamb of God then, but also the King of kings. So Paul, after 57 verses of doctrine and theology in 1 Corinthians 15, now climactically, affectionately, gives us the now what of life. What you and I now, in light of the truth of the risen Christ, are to be doing in each and every circumstance in our life. That every morning you wake up, or to have this optimistic, divine expectation on how you are to live in light of the risen Christ. Belief empowers our behavior. And in light of the glorious action and victorious resurrection of Christ, let us not only believe, but also live out, be transformed by the power of the living Christ in us. What does that look like in your life? What does that look like in our church moving forward? Look at verse 58 of 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in your labor, the Lord in his work is not in vain. Paul says that you and I are to be active. We're to be intentional. We're to be specifically here, steadfast. See this word here? It's the first command in 1 Corinthians 15. It is functioning here as an adjective. It means one who is seated, one who is unmoved, unchanged, solid in his post. On August the 24th, 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted, completely destroyed the ancient Roman city of Pompeii. Historians tell us that the devastation was so catastrophic of this volcano that it was literally one and a half million tons of debris every second upon this region. 20 feet of debris every second completely annihilated this city. As archaeologists years later began to uncover the rubble and began to discover what actually happened in this city, they found something interesting right by the gate. They found a soldier right at the gate of Pompeii with a spear ready to fight in the same position in which the avalanche and the volcano erupted behind them. That is what we are supposed to be, Paul says. We are to be stead fast. We are literally to be fixed, settled, firmly situated in the situation that God has placed us. Paul renders this in such a fashion that we are to always be settled in our convictions, always to be firm of the gospel. You and I are always to be dogmatic about the mission of Christ and the gospel of Christ. Not only dogmatic, but bulldogmatic. We are to be steadfast. You see, the believers at Corinth were not. The believers at Corinth, before this letter from Paul, were vacillating. They were prone to fickleness. They, they were adhering to culture. They weren't impacting culture. They were being infected by the culture. They weren't allowing the word-driven, Christ-centered mission of God to dominate their life. No, they were allowing the culture to influence these things. Paul says, no, not you. Not God's beloved. You're to be stead Fast in your convictions. Or to be as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Now the life I live, I live by faith. Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Paul told the church in Rome, in Romans 1, 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. That you and I are to be convicted about the gospel. We're to have a conviction of this mission and gospel in and through our lives. We're to be steadfast. For our king is alive. 
And he tells his followers in Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, verse 19, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. The meaninglessness of life has been crushed by the risen Christ. For now, all life is found in him and through him. And nothing promotes stability more than the assurance of his future victory. Because you and I know that we have a risen king who abides and reigns in and through us, we must be steadfast, always fixed, settled, firmly situated in the context that God has placed us. We must have a conviction of gospel truth and the necessity of mission, a purpose in which he and he alone has called us to. We must be steadfast. Paul also says, you ready for this? We're to be immovable. Paul builds on this point and he adds intensity. He describes here an immovable object, one that is motionless, a super not moving object. We are not to be moved away from God's will or mission. We're to stand firm in his work and will. All great entities, all great Christ followers have these characteristics. In fact, I was reading this week of, of a doctor by the name of Dr. Kevin Elko. He has been instrumental in Super Bowl champions throughout the years. Heisman Trophy winners throughout the years. In fact, Nick Saban, the former coach of the University of Alabama, called Dr. Kevin Elko the real coach of Alabama. You see, Dr. Kevin Elko is a sports psychologist. He's known as the champion's psychologist. Champion after champion meets with Dr. Elko, and he says there are two qualities of every champion. Are you ready for this? Number one, they believe in themselves. They are immovable to any object. You can't distract them. You can't move them. They are immovable in their belief. Secondly, you ready for this? They are also ownerships of their beliefs. They own themselves. They take responsibility for their actions, for their attitudes, and their efforts. Dr. Elko says, when you have habits that are powerful, they become effective. But make no mistake, habits that not are daily intentional will be meaningless. That you will have a habitual lifestyle of habits that will not achieve what you desire for them to achieve. You must believe in yourself. You must secondly take ownership of yourself. Paul has this same view in mind for us. We are to be immovable. We are to believe in the lordship of Jesus Christ over every aspect of our lives. We are also to receive his ownership over our actions, over our motives, and over our lives. You and I are to live in such a way that Jesus Christ is to direct every aspect. And we give our best and we trust him with the rest. And can I tell you, as a church, we've always been our best when we have this mindset. You and I started as a dream of a handful of people 120 years ago. We didn't have a building. We didn't have facilities. But there was a need. We had the gospel. And we would do whatever it took to get the gospel to as many as God's people would allow us. And so we wrote a Baptist organization and ask if they could give us a railroad car because we began to notice that there were a gathering place in downtown BA of God's people. In fact, the grain silo is a very appropriate marker right at about 50 yards of where we started, right there by those railroad tracks. And pretty soon, God began to fill up this railroad car and God began to bless his people. And so we went right across the street to the north, just a little bit of ways. We built this church ourselves. And this white steeple church began to be a marker of God's provision and God's favor upon his people. And as God began to fill this white steeple church, we went right across the street again and we bought this acreage in downtown BA. So many of you affectionately have known it through the years as the Rock Church. Our people built this Rock Church as God built in and through his people. And so as they would work all day, they would come to this piece of land and they would work all night together, often picnicking on the grounds and 
kids in our ministries would go to a local quarry and would bring rocks and brick by brick, rock by rock, our people would build his church on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for decades, God blessed. We began to see an expansion of ministry all throughout most of the 1900s. Up until the millennium, there was just this blockade of dominance for almost 80 years there as God continued to work in and through his people. New ministries started. Mission agencies launched. People now globally and locally taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. About the turn of the millennium, God began to do a work in our hearts and began to give us a vision for what was next, beginning to be able to ask God to help us see what no one else could see. And on the north side of nowhere, Oklahoma, it seemed, there was 150 acres set aside 150 acres that was going to be used for a water park, of all things. Huge slide was being put in. I still wish we had that slide so we could do baptisms over and over and over again, right? <laughs> God closed the door on that company, and he opened a door for our church to be steadfast and immovable to what God had next. And for almost 25 years now, you and I have been benefiting from such faith. Well, now this is our turn. Now you and I have the chance to set the next 20 to 25 years, to ask God to do abundantly more in the next chapters of life. And look what God has done. Look how God has blessed your steadfastness, your ability to be immovable to what the Lord has called you to do. I believe God has prepared us for all of this to prepare us now for what he has for us in Christ that you and I would be encouraged as we press on toward B.A. and beyond to be steadfast, immovable, here we go, always abounding in the work of the Lord, Paul says. This word abounding here conveys a lifestyle that exceeds expectations, a lifestyle that refuses to just meet the requirements necessary, no, but to be go over and over and beyond. More and more above the exceeding expectations is the emphasis in verse 58. It describes here an abundant overflowing in serving the Lord. To give yourself fully in doing whatever God has called you to do. That by God's grace we would be steadfast, immovable, always abounding. You know, one of the sad things about greater still, is, is that I'm not going to be able to wear this shirt for you anymore. This is about the sixth or eighth time on this stage in the last two years that I've worn this shirt. And, and Nevertheless, it never fails. After every service, someone comes up to me and says, you know, Pastor, I was listening to your sermon today, and I was just hungry. I said, hungry? What do you mean? Hungry for the Word of God? No, I was literally hungry. And I said, why? He said, because with your jacket, all I see is EAT of greater still. Eat. No more after today. Only BA and beyond. But here is something I want you to think of. As now many of you have two or three of these shirts in your closets and you're wondering what to do with them. You see this word here? Abounding. It's used intentionally several times in the New Testament. It was used of the miracle of Christ who fed the 5,000 in John chapter 6, verse 13, where Christ takes this little boy's lunch and keeps multiplying it aboundingly over and over and over again. So much so, the Bible says there were 12 baskets left over. Our king fed 15 to 20,000 people, because remember, they only counted the men in John chapter 6. But yet, abundantly, more than what was expected, our king provided. It's the same word used of Christ when he says in John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it, what? Abundantly. It's the same word used by Paul in Ephesians chapter one, verses seven through eight, that describes the abundant grace of God. How much grace does our God give you an abundant, exceedingly over and abound amount? His grace is always enough. It's the same word used in the greatest prayer in the New Testament. A prayer that you and I started this entire two-year journey on in Ephesians 3.20 where Paul says, and may God by his grace do abundantly more than what you and I can think or 
ask. Paul says that we are to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That this blessing of God leads to a lifestyle for God. And His work deserves our all and our best. That in light of the endless grace of God, in light of the infinite power of the resurrection, in light of the truth of the gospel of Christ, Paul says, you and I must always fully give abundantly more in reaching the lost, abundantly more to multiplying disciples, abundantly our best in all aspects that God calls us. Why? Because his work deserves our all and our best. This is why Paul says in Colossians 3, verse 23, we'll get to this next week, you and I are to work heartily unto the Lord with everything we've got. I was thinking about this text this week, and I thought about an evangelist in England during their second great awakening named John Blanchard. And someone asked John Blanchard at the end of his life, how did God do such a mighty work, John? What was it? And John said, it wasn't what, it was who. It was Christ in and through his people. How did so many tens of thousands of people come to faith in Christ in England? Because there was a faithful few that were steadfast and immovable that every single day they begged God to do as much as I can, as well as I can, for as long as I can. And God abundantly blessed them to that end. Are you doing such things? Are you steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Are you asking God what in every single day, whatever it takes Lord, because the gospel compels us to work hard. The gospel compels us to give more of our life and our treasure and our talents that every single one of us would work as hard as the Lord would allow for his glory to lead and to accomplish what he and he alone can do through his people. Paul ends this charge in verse 58. Look at it with an encouragement, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. See this word know here? It is not the usual word for knowledge in the New Testament. Paul is not speaking here of of just factual knowledge, but no experiential knowledge. Knowledge that you can see with your own eyes. You see, the Bible says that life is a wonderful thing. And thus it is a terrible thing to waste. You and I get one shot to glorify Christ. And so may we be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor, you see this word in verse 58? It's a very intense word in the original languages. It speaks of a consuming, laboring to the point of exhaustion. One who gives their all with nothing Left. Is that you in this season of life? Is your life making a kingdom impact? I can think of no better time than right now than to be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work that the Lord has given you. You see, there's a reason why Paul ends 1 Corinthians 15 with this charge. You see, because our king rose victorious on that first Sunday, you and I can live every day with his glory, in his power, knowing that his work in and through us will never return void, that there will be a result, that there will be fruit, and thus a reward. That no matter how insignificantly small or insignificant, God sees our work. And God will perfect that work and bless that work for his glory. That you and I are to be about the ways of the kingdom 
For saving faith is in Jesus alone, but true faith is never alone. Real faith cares by caring. Real faith loves by loving. Real faith moves to action for his glory. You and I gathered as a group of people two years ago with a vision and a prayer that God would do abundantly more in and through us. That we would devote ourselves 100% to greater ministry, greater missions, and greater future. And we praise God for what he has done. Every single Sunday, we are weekly seeing new families in our preschool ministry. For the last two years, we've been asking God what he could do abundantly more in our kids' ministry. So we've completely revamped our midweek ministries for kids, seeing some of the largest attendance in years on Wednesday nights. We're seeing several of those families now beginning to come on Sunday mornings, and we've been continuing to engage our kids with a multi-generational worship strategy. Our student ministry is, is seen unparalleled numbers in the last handful of years, is we have more students serving actively on Sunday morning than any other time on the hill. We praise God for all of this new work that the Lord is doing in students and allowing our, our, our teams and, and our people to engage middle schools and high schools and most elementary schools in Broken Arrow for the gospel. We praise the Lord that, that we've had outreach events that the Lord has tended to bless. We had a dodgeball night several months ago where over 400 students attended. A handful of them accepted Christ that night. Those 400 students were some of the largest students ever gathered right here on this hill, and this is just the beginning. We praise God in our adult ministries as, as we have new classes that are beginning to develop and launch in the summer and the fall. We've had an opportunity to rework our 365 curriculum to maximize multi-generational impact. We have seen, by God's grace, bless the work of our Next Steps ministries, uh, where we've had a new Hispanic ministry that has launched out. For the first time in the 120-year history of our church, we had Hispanics worshiping at the same time we were on our campus. 31 attended our Easter services this past Easter. We praise God for the hundreds that have gone through our Next Step 101 classes in the last two years and the thousands that have been gathering in worship. The opportunity that we have had through outreach events, both at Christmas and Easter, to see hundreds and hundreds of people that have never stepped foot on this campus. All of this is just a glimpse of what God is giving us and asking of us during this season. That you and I would be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. Everything we do for Christ will come at a cost. But nothing we ever do for the sake of Christ will ever be a loss. May we never wander from the word of God. May we never waver on the will of God. May we always be about the work of God as we are urgently, steadfast, always immovable, abounding in the work that the Lord has for us, knowing this work will not be in vain. Your life is a direct result of your devotions. Direct result of what you are 100% engaging upon. May we be steadfast. May we be immovable. May we always abound in the work of the Lord as we treasure Christ in his mission over all things for his glory. Church, may we press on, always be pressing on toward BA and beyond. Now I wanna end our services like we began this journey two years ago together. And so as I begin to pray for you, I'm gonna ask that if all who are able, that you would come down to this altar and we would have a time of thanksgiving in celebration, like God has done over his people in the Old Testament, as God's done through his people in the New Testament, and as we have done two years prior, I wanna have a special thanksgiving and prayer for you. This has been an incredible journey that we have all been on together. This has been a journey of sacrifice, 
Many of you have given over and above. Many of you have given for the first time ever. Many of you have given of yourselves and of your treasures and of your talents and never before. And I wanna be the first to say thank you. I wanna be the first to acknowledge this God-given work. I also wanna be the one who champions most what God has called you to now. May you be steadfast. May you be immovable. May you always abound in the work that he has given you for his glory and his glory alone. As you and I together reach BA and beyond by multiplying disciples to follow Jesus. So church, as the Lord leads, would you come? Everyone who is able, let's come to this altar and let's pray together. If you bow your head and close your eyes, as you begin to make your way, come to this altar, prepare your hearts. For those that are able, you can take a knee. We have seats available right here on our front row. Join me in prayer. Our Father God, as your people come, God, we once again consecrate ourselves and give ourselves to you. Father, we once again get caught up in the wonder of the one true King, the Lord Jesus Christ. That Father, we ask once again the dedication of ourselves to your gospel, to your mission, to take Christ in his glory, Christ in his gospel, to the ends of the earth. Father, as hundreds of your people gather here, Father, would you hear the cries of your people? That God, that what you've laid on our hearts, may we finish. That Father, what you've impressed upon our minds, may we be immovable. That Father, what you called of our lives, that we would always abound in the work of the Lord. And Father, may you make our faith sight, knowing that this work of the Lord is not in vain. And so church, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just pray right now, as Paul does, for your steadfastness? Whatever it is the Lord has laid on your heart, would you just ask God, may I be steadfast? Would you pray that right now? Secondly, whatever the Lord has called of your life, would you ask him, Lord, may I be immovable. May I always abound in this work. Would you pray that right now? For your heart and for your home, for our church, pray it right now. Finally, would you pray for our church that we'll be faithful in the years to come in ministry, missions, and future. Pray that right now. Father, we thank you for the prayers of your people. Your word says that the fervent prayer of a righteous Christ follower availeth much. And God, as we leave this place, reach BA and beyond, multiply disciples to follow your Son. Father, may we be steadfast and movable. May we always abound in your work, knowing, Lord, your work that you have for us and through us will never be in vain. 
It is in the name of, of all names we pray and ask these things. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.